Greetings and salutations, all you beautiful people. Welcome back to League Unlock. Eric and Mark here with you guys to wrap up a little bit of MSI player rankings. We're sliding into the bot lane ADCs and supports. And I know I said mid lane is the most stacked role, and it probably is still, but matchup wise, some of these 2v2s. Uh, and AD carry, head-to-head -head carry team fights are some of the matchups I'm the most excited for, especially because the spiciest part of the meta these days is probably the bot lane. I mean, any other year, you might be able to go to the bottom lane and say, this is where all the heat is coming from for this MSI. Unfortunately, or fortunately, depends on how you're looking at it, we do have the stacked mid lane and the top lane. Whatever one you really want to pick of those solo lanes, they are juiced. But that doesn't mean that the bottom lane doesn't bring the heat like we know it does for MSI. Yes, both the ADCs and supports, extremely interesting angles to talk about with these players. Dive right into it. Let's start with those marksmen and towards the bottom of the table. You'll immediately see... The LCS, a couple of ADCs making their international debuts. Obviously, Masu is a very fresh rookie. Really, what you should be looking for, for both him and Jan here at this event, is it's a learning experience. You're going against some of the best bot lanes in the world. Yes, they're most likely going to be outmatched. But when you take off the ankle weights and go back to the LCS, they're going to be feeling great for summer. And I think uh, especially for Masu, that has to be the approach is just gaining that experience, gaining that exposure, seeing all these type of things, learning and trying to bring that back and improve upon yourself in the long term as a player. I think for Jan, the focus should be a little bit different where there is, yes, that angle of still improving, still bringing on that potential and everything else. But I want to see some adaptability from this player. I want to see that angle of not just I need to take these lessons, this exposure back home to the LCS and practice, keep improving. I need to see the, okay, that was a rough game or that was this type of scenario. But what is the rebound for tomorrow? What is the next step? And then making that adjustment and seeing that come through in game with that performance, that I think should be that expectation or that push towards a higher level for someone like Jan compared to where Masu is at this point in his career. And, and let's be honest, it's really an opportunity for both of these guys because the expectation is not super high for them to be dominating any of these marquee matchups against some of these other top laners. And we know the potential we've heard from casters, we've heard from players, we've heard from ourselves. The potential for Masu is so high. So I don't know, maybe he'll show up and perform even better than we were getting out of the LCS. But with low expectations, there's absolutely an opportunity for both of these LCS squads. But you got to give a guy like Betty, Mr. International Veteran, a little bit of a nod ahead of these LCS fellas. It's the consistency that we have seen from Betty all the way through his career, whether it has been domestic success or it has been rising to the occasion on the international scene. We have seen him be able to do that before. You look at his performance throughout this year for, uh, with PSG and you're absolutely seeing that same level of contribution. This is still going to be somebody that you can rely upon to give you that damage, to make those big plays when it matters from that bottom lane. Then it's the LEC duo. Both guys getting pentakills in their playoff push, but even though he was runner-up in those finals against G2, Individually, I don't think anyone can argue that Noah has had a better playoff run as an ADC, being the featured guy, the reliable one for Fnatic. When team fights roll around, maybe Humanoids having a little bit too much fun. Oscar Rinnan's a little bit behind. It is Noah who is the featured guy that time and time again comes up clutch for the black and gold. He's that insurance angle for Fnatic. When they're talking about where Razork or Humanoid might lead you out to something or in these, these situations, you mentioned sometimes questions. Sometimes it doesn't quite go that way. And when it doesn't, that damage, that skill from Noah, that is your backline. That is that fallback for Fnatic where they do get that faith. And we've seen that execution. We've seen that power be there for Fnatic throughout this run and throughout some of these challenges against G2 as well. That is that checkmark point. And I think when you're looking at both of these guys, both of these European ADCs offer you quite a lot, quite a bit more of a step up in the situation where we're moving in these power rankings. Han Sama, someone that I think has an opportunity in front of him to really lay it on, get together a great performance and really start entering a conversation where you're talking about him 
as the greatest bot lane from bot laner from the LEC, maybe into the category where players like Reckless have been talked about in that type of position, that type of long stay and longevity before. A great performance here from Han Sama would accelerate those discussions. Absolutely. If we're getting a couple of international solid performances again out of him, I mean, you're approaching eight years that we've been seeing Han Sama on the rift. So hasn't been quite the same level this split that we've seen out of previous splits. So yeah, another opportunity for him. Uh, but Noah, honestly, you might accept arguments to even put him ahead of Pays in that four spot who's been slumping a little bit, but we're kind of... We're given that respect for Pace playing in the LCK and being on Gen G, who won yet another split, but he has by no means been close to the level we got out of him in his rookie year. It's kind of hard to unseat a guy that just has, what is it, three straight finals appearances, three straight finals victories. He's never yeah, lost Pace. in the LCK in his career. It's wonky. I know it's it's relatively short but still for relatively short that's an insane amount of success still at the most beginning guys of never career. get three lck titles in their whole career as, as keen how hard how long of a journey it was to get to just that number one on the trophy list pays he's got a couple of them and pays heading towards this event does get that nod ahead of the european adcs part of that is that respect of realizing it part of it is also knowing that he's vulnerable at this position i think hansama noah Heck, even Betty really start to pop off, really have a great event. They could leapfrog in this type of situation where you're feeling the power is uh, at the event amongst these ADC players. Right now, Pays is rolling in that spot. And I don't think it's going to be pedestrian Pays. Passenger Princess Pays. I don't think that's what it's going to be for all that long. I really think that he's starting going to start to warm up. MSI could be the event for it. Which is when Genji truly becomes a terrifying prospect is when that bot lane levels up to what the rest of the squad is putting out on the rift. But the biggest gap on this list is 100% when you get to the top three. And Jackie Love is that uh, barrier because, I mean, individually, even him versus Pace, you felt a whole lot better about Jackie Love throughout the entirety of spring. I think when you're climbing up to where no one Hansama is, maybe that's the stratosphere, uh, you know, the atmosphere type of thing. You're in a whole nother universe when we're talking about the likes of Jackie, Love, Guma, UC, and you're stepping up to Elk at number one. Yes, these are the three that are rolling through at the tippity top and are in a different league of their own for the power that they are bringing and the lethality that we have seen from them so far this year. It has been a continued climb. It might have been a little bit slow, but it has absolutely exploded in the last little bit for a player like Jackie Love to get back to the ultra prime type of territory. I don't say ultra prime is in the team. I mean the quality that we are getting from your boy, Jackie Love. That is a difference. And he certainly has been showing it on every sort of champion, including, of course, the Draven that we love to see him pilot. Best Draven at the event. Sorry, Han Sama. It's got to go the way of Jackie Love for that one. But then ahead of him, a pretty easy top two, I think, even though, again, Guma lost to Genji and Pays in the finals. I don't think anyone in their right mind was saying that Genji's bot lane outperformed T1 in those finals. No, there's zero question about that one as far as where the difference maker was, who you could trust to try and be that guy for your team. It was Guma. He was the guy stepping up. He was the difference maker. He was the X factor all the way through that series for Team One, whether they were going to come across the finish line as the victors or not. He did so much to try and get it. Unfortunately, not enough in the end, but what we did see was absolutely a hero. Guma is that guy, and he's got that type of power, got that type of skill, got that form right now for T1 heading into this event. The only thing that stops him, the only thing, is if he was able to get that championship, I think he gets that little bit of an edge, a little bit more of that trust and firepower difference over someone like Elk, who does roll on through, does capture the championship in the LPL, and continue that dominant form that we have seen him evolve into, compared to even the great form that he was in last year. He truly has hit a whole nother level in the incredibly difficult region that is the LPL as an ADC. It's crazy. I mean, we were talking about him at times as a top 380 carry on the planet throughout last year. And he has leveled up uh, to a higher level. Not only does he win finals, he gets MVP for it. 
best Lucian maybe in the world. You can even throw Ruler's name in there right now, what he was putting off in these finals, and him and On as a duo were just absolutely lethal. So Elk 100% locked in that number one spot. I'm, I, if we get the dream of a BLG T1 matchup at any point in time, that Lucian pick in that bottom lane is crucial for whatever team locks that one down. Now the buddies in the bot lane, we know they're even more vital than ever probably in this season when you are talking about supports. And again, unfortunately, just like their brethren in the ADC spot, the other LCS supports, Core JJ and Busio towards the bottom half of this list, but they're I mean, Busio's kind of in the same boat because he's a young player. Core JJ obviously has a whole lot of international experience. I mean, you don't think Core JJ's a, a young player an anymore? Upstart player? little rookie who's 30 years old and been playing for eight years, yeah. A little bit of a difference between the two of them. And yes, let's start with Core JJ because I think this is an individual that is maybe not necessarily at the peaks that we have seen him at before when we have checked in with the Team Liquid that is going to an international event. That doesn't mean that he is all washed up. I don't want that to be the expectation or the understanding of where this core JJ is coming from and what you can expect and what you can't expect from him at this type of event. I think that one of the things is you do need to expect the unexpected type of situation. You do need to be aware that you might get a vintage core JJ performance that can be an absolute backbreaker, can be that difference maker for the side of Team Liquid I don't think anyone should be expecting it heading into the event is the type of thing, but you do need to have that awareness of that history of that career that he has put together. And on the other side, Masu, what he, I mean, sorry, Busio, excuse me, the other side of Masu, what we're going to be getting with FlyQuest. This is another one where we're checking in about the growth, the, uh, you know, uh, continuation of his career and what we're going to see from him. I think he's got it. I think we've seen some creativity from him before in the LCS, and I'm not just talking about, the, of course, the Azir support that was... Uh, uh, maybe that's the secret at this year's MSI, break the double ADCs? We've seen some flexibility around Azir and, you know, tank Azir and all these things. Maybe that rolls in to the equation, but I think for someone like Busio, again, it still kind of falls in with Masu. Build that experience, get that exposure, and you're still in that position to take that back to the LCS and improve. But he finds himself more so along that yawn line that I was talking about, where I also want to see some adaptability from your boy Busio. He is that one, one year along further than someone like Masu in the process. It feels like the two LEC supports, both Mickey and Jun, are more likely and more capable of being the spicy sides of the meta. We know that Jun's Blitzcrank has been permabanned at times against him, and Mickey, he may be inting on the Nautilus these days, but something like a Nico, something off meta, he's still the king of cooking something up in Europe. And I'm still, I may, maybe call me delusional, but I'm still not pre prepared to, uh, to write off the Nautilus from Nicky because I know we've seen him on the Nautilus find those angles, find the threat that he can be on that beast from uh, below. He's, he's just like Hill is saying, he can be 0-7 in a game, but then find a game-changing hook and win the game. It's it's something in the cuisine over, over in Europe. It's got to be. I'm convinced, and I love you, brought up Jun on the Blitzcrank. That is 100% X-Factor territory. Write that one up for Fnatic. That is one that if you want to test yourself, you're going to let that one through. And if you do... Or oh, you're feeling the pain because you better believe that he's going to be getting ahead. He's going to be getting humanoid ahead. And oh, what's that? That's Noah ahead by a lot. And that is a dangerous situation when you're facing Fnatic. And yeah, throw Jun in in that 2v2 is one of the main reasons why Noah gets so far ahead. I know Razzler gives a lot of attention to that bot lane, but the 2v2 of Fnatic throughout the playoff run absolutely leveled up as a duo. And their synergy is on point right now. Lahen slides into that four spot. I don't think you're talking about him slumping in the same way that we've seen out of Pace. He's had some pretty good roams. He seems comfortable back on this Gen G lineup, but he's got to deal with a resurgent Mako in that three spot. Who you go back to last year at the Asian Games when Mako was on this roster, people were saying this guy's career is done. He's washed. He shouldn't even be playing in 2024. Fast forward now to him on TES. He's an all-pro level support again. I think with Lahens, I want people to be prepared for that adaptability, for that bounce back. We have seen that game four against T1. My brother, he could not 
hit any single ability from Nami in any of these moments that mattered whatsoever. 2v2. Team fights didn't matter. He was not getting a single thing. Goes under the Annie. Yes, it's Annie. I know. Does get the performance. Makes the crucial plays. Gets it done for Gen G. You know how you count, can't counter double 80 carries? It's the Singe support. Bring it out, Lehens. Oh. It's time. I would love me some juicy Singe support. And yes, Lehens is the guy that will be busting it out for us if we're seeing it. You gotta be rolling with Mako at that number three spot. And this has been a resurgence for his career, a reestablishment, reinsertion of himself into the minds of the LPL fans to remind them and say that, yes, I am one of these top options down here in the bottom lanes. I'm gonna make sure that my team and especially my ADC is popping up. And we have absolutely seen that from him with the effect on top esports. You know, we talked so many times throughout the course of Jackie Love's career about that pairing of the of the support and keeping that leash just on him. I don't think there even is a leash with Jackie Love right now in Mako. I think he's just the dog whisperer. He's got it. He's the Caesar Milan getting right into there, and he's got that communication, and it is working fantastic for top esports. Yeah, one of the main reasons why Jackie Love is having one of the best splits he's had in years is Mako coming over, but it's still an easy consensus top two of Kyria and On. I'm willing to accept arguments either way. I know On just had a fantastic finals against TES and Kyria, I mean, since the second time, or when they played D+, the whole loser's bracket run, he absolutely turned it back on to peak MVP, best support in the world levels when Guma gets to pick center or is forced to pick center. That's when you get the Orn, the Sejuani's, or these double 80 carries when he's with the Kalista, but both Kyria and On have been playing the Camille support a little bit. These are the two guys who are gonna be shaping the bot lane better. It's unfortunate and it feels unfair to Mako because of what a journey and what a rebound he has had in his career and being at the number three spot because, well, these guys exist and they have done what they have been doing the past year and plus at this point right now. And I think what it comes down to for me is gonna be that equation of whether you want just raw performance right now. And for that point, you're rolling with on. You're taking him. You're taking what happened through these LPL playoffs, through the LPL finals and saying, yes, that is that doubling down, tripling down on the performances that we saw all the way through that regular split. This is that next level for that bottom lane duo. And specifically, of course, on in this situation on how he is enabling not just Elk, but again, the rest of this roster. Players like Knight really popping off with some extra help in that situation. But you go to Kyria if you're looking for that X factor, if you're looking for the difference maker, someone to change the fortunes of the standard or the expected result, that's where Kyria can come in. And that is, of course, the spicy champion pool. I know we have not necessarily seen the same combination of spices and cooking going on for the T1 bottom lane compared to the past, compared to the world championship run. You know, that's one of those ones where that will ebb and flow type of situationally on where you are and where the meta is and all these type of things. But I think you can't always trust in the creativity and the execution on it from Kyria. And that's why for me, at least, I'm valuing that over more so just the raw performance and dominance that we have seen from someone like On throughout the OPL. And let's be honest, in the micro meta game that happens at these international events, that was one of the biggest reasons why T1 won Worlds is because they were the quickest, most efficient, and best at adapting to this new meta that happens at the World Championship. And a lot of that stems from Kyria. So maybe that's a repeat of what happens here at MSI. But for that to happen, they have to, you know, finally take down the LPL, who have been the kings of MSI for like three years now. It's, it's uh, what is the unmovable object meets the unstoppable force type of situation. T1, unstoppable versus the LPL. And then the LPL, you know, they're invulnerable at MSI. They're unable to be taken at down. At home, MSI too? Oh, damn. Dial that one up. You're dialing up the Gen G international debuff. Oh, there's a whole world of situations. A lot of equations, a lot of formulas you got to be figuring out for who takes hold this MSI. But I'm guaranteeing bangers across these LPL LCK matchups throughout this event. But that is it today for League Unlock. Eric and Mark here with you, beauties. As always, thanks for hanging out, and we will catch you on that flippity flip.